Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Man, the man joining us today is an Illinois basketball legend. Matter of fact, I'm going to say uh, 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 legend isn't even a word I can use for this one. I mean, he was a standout at Simeon High School, Mr. Basketball for the state of Illinois, and a McDonald's All-American. He's the all-time leading scorer for the fight in the line. Now, now come on, Alana got some greats, but he is the all-time leading scorer. Played mm. 14 years professionally overseas, won two EuroLeague championship, three Israeli league championship, and was elected to the All-Century team at Illinois. Man, we want to welcome a true legend to the Hoop Dreams podcast, Chicago's very own (laughs) Mr. Dion Thomas. I'm Will Gates, and that's my dog. Arthur A.G. in the building. We got the legend of the city of of the Chi-Town on our podcast, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) This was special, Um, man. This was special. No, trust me, fellas. This is this is my pleasure, man. I mean, you you too. I, I appreciate all those accolades. I appreciate that introduction, man. But you you two are another couple of legends that put the shy on the map, man. I, I just happened to come a little bit before y'all, but what you two did, man, is, is and I'm telling you, the movie, the following of y'all lives, what you guys have been able to do. Hey, you you, you got legend status too, but I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate the love. That's big ups coming from the legend, baby. We appreciate oh, that. Oh, no doubt. I've seen Hoop Dreams about 15, 20 times. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm I'm glad you said that because actually that's that's my first question. When was the first time you watched Hoop Dreams and what was your thoughts? Well, you know what I, I was when I watched it, it just took me back. Um you know, because we grew up all pretty much in the same area, same area, same thing, same way. Yeah. So, you know, when you're in your when you're in your personal bubble, you you think it's just you, you, you know, and then, you you know, even though your friends are in the same living situations, a lot of the time you think it's just you. But when I was able to watch Hoop Dreams for the first time, I'm like, man, OK, it wasn't just me. You know, these young men had to fight and battle through the same things that I had to fight and battle through. Mm-hmm. And then when the love really came for you guys straight up is when I went overseas and I had people asking me once it came out after a while, I was like, man, do you know them? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I was like, man, I was like, you gotta understand, we all from the shop. We know everybody. Absolutely. You know, it may not be personal or long time connections or things like that, but we all know everyone. We follow everyone. And I was like, that's what we do. I was like, that's yeah. Chicago basketball love. I don't care. You know, maybe some of those blue divisions didn't really get much love, but <laughs> <laughs> right, the blue. Yeah. But let's just be let's just be honest. You know, Catholic mm-hmm. League, red, where you whatever. We we followed and we made sure that everybody knew everybody. So that's where I, I'm going to tell you, guys, people were watching y'all even overseas, man. Wow. Wow. Big time. That's why I say you talking about I'm, I got legendary status. Dude, y'all got legendary status. What kind of impact did it have on you, though, man? I mean, obviously, you shared with us about how overseas, but I often wonder, man, like when we ask people that question, did it have the kind of impact that you felt a sense of pride? Because like you said, it was, we were all going through the same type, similar things. And the reason I ask you this question is simply because, you know, we interviewed Scoop Jackson a while ago. And man, one of the things he said was, you know, but Will, it was, it was just life. So I want to get your thoughts on that. What, what, what impact did it have with you? No, and and Scoop is right, man. It it was life. It was real life, you know, Mm -hmm. and you you always want to see um, your people do well through the struggle, yeah. through all yeah. the, you know, injuries, the home life, all that other stuff. And you want to see your people do well. And when you can battle beyond that and, and put yourself in a good situation, then it changes everything for you. It's, it's almost like, uh, you know, looking at your situation and saying, OK, you know what? And this is for people, of course, that were younger than you guys. And this is the imp- where well, your impact really stood out for people was okay, if they can do it, I can do it. You know, if Dion can do it, I can do it. You know, you guys know Howard Moore. 
Uh, I had That's Howard awesome. tell me one time when Howard, when Howard hired me over at UIC. So mm. I'm working for Howard. And Howard was like, Dion, he was like, you know, I've been your fan since, and you know, when we're here, we're a year apart. And he was like, I've been your mm. fan ever since, you know, you were at Simeon. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? He pulls out an article from, they interviewed him in high school. And he was like, yep, Dion Thomas, if he can do it, I can do it. That's my motivation. Mm. You know, I was like his white rabbit. Wow. So what you guys did, you know, they, you guys, you, you were the white rabbits for others that came behind you. So, you know, Scoop is yeah. right. It's life. It's life. Yeah. But motivation comes when they see the successes that people can have, regardless of the struggles that we went through. And that's what you guys provided a lot of people with mm -hmm. looking at your real life situation. And first of all, I give you guys credit, man. That's a, that's a lot. That takes a lot of uh, toughness, uh, a, a lot of intestinal fortitude to be able to shine a light you know, and you guys were young, man. To be able to shine yeah, a light at that age. So man. look, we, hey, 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 Dion, not to cut you off, but me and Will always give, you know, props and kudos to our mothers because they the ones that signed off on it. You know, they at that time, wasn't no cameras coming up in no black black folks cribs no. filming <laughs> they real life and they, <laughs> mom and them wasn't we just wasn't that that openness with with our life like that, but. Mm -hmm. It was some about this opportunity uh, that they saw in their sons that they was like, okay, I I, I think this will, will will be good for my son to maybe mature faster and grow up, uh, and and they just and they and me and, and Steve James and them definitely took advantage of it because <laughs> they was they was there in some damn some some nasty moments, but you know for all of that to get. Uh, filmed and 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 you know, shout out to the world, man. We always give our moms Emma Gates and Sheila Ag the, the credit, man, for even allowing this to even happen. Oh, no doubt. And you know, yeah. again, I grew up with my mom the same. Well, again, we grew up very similar, yeah. if not the same. I don't know if my mom would have let the camera come in my. <laughs> 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 let, let, let's just be real about it. I don't right. know if Joanna would have let that would have let the camera cover in her crib, man, because there was far too many times she had to hand out ass whoopings. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if she would have wanted that on video. Hey D, what what exactly did you live on the south side of Chicago? Well, let's that's that's let's start it off because I'm actually from the west side. I grew up in the village over on uh 14th and Loomis. Really? So damn. Yeah. I, I didn't move to Inglewood, um, which is 71st and Stewart, until I was in seventh grade. Wow. So seventh grade through my sophomore year, I lived on the south side. Wow. And then I moved, and then I moved right back to the I moved right back to the west side. Um, by this time, I was living with my grandmother over on Wabash, right off of Roosevelt and Damon. Mm. So I'm so I'm a west sider, man. I just went to high school on wow. the south side. So, so you was tough before you went to the west. Before you, before you went to the south side. Damn right. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's when you're growing up in the village. <laughs> in the village, village Damn. ain't no joke. Oh yeah. It's, I'm I'm glad you brought that up, man. We want to ask you about the the Dion Thomas origin story. Talk to us about your childhood. You know, you were born in Chicago. Talk a bit mm -hmm. about your neighborhood and what was it like growing up in the '70s and the '80s for you? Man, whoa. Well, you, you know what it was like, because you know, a lot of people will tell you how difficult it was, you know, how crazy mm -hmm. it was. I didn't know how poor we were. I had no mm -hmm. idea. You know, wow. I didn't know because everyone else around us was the same way. I mean, I didn't figure out how broke I was, so I got to Illinois. And I was like, damn, we poor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because wow. it, it, was, it was a norm to... You know, not have the the phones one month or, or have the lights another month. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that stuff is normal. You know, my my grandmother used to always say, "Yeah, we got to steal from Peter to pay Paul." Mm. You know, so it, it that was the norm. But you know how it is, man. It's growing up when you in the hood. It's always the same way. Right. You, you can't you can't allow yourself to get punked. So there were a whole lot of fights growing up. Wow. Because if not, everybody's gonna try you. I remember the first time I was in like fourth grade and this one i was going to medill mm. and i got i got chased by four dudes from medill and ran all the way to the crib got to the crib my mom was like 
why you come busting in the door like that? I'm like, whoo, I got some guys chasing me. She was like, all right, turn right on back around. So she caught the kids walking down the street and was like, come on back here. And I had to fight all, all four of them, one at a time. What? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> one at a time, I had to fight all four of those kids. And she grabbed me after, you know, after I put my hands on them. She grabbed me. And she was like, don't you ever fucking run from nobody else in your life. Mm, she was like, wow. because if, one, if you run from one every day, somebody's going to try you. Mm. What did a young, what did a young Dion think at that moment? Like after it happened, like, damn, my mama just gave me some. Lunch. Well, you know, when you that age, you don't, you don't really pick up on the lessons. You, you take right. them and you keep rolling. But yep. my mother, and, I, and I'll say this, was my greatest teacher, you know, mm. on, on, on both sides of the fence. Cause she was mm. always telling us as kids, she was like, baby, because you, you hear me speak. I, yep. I don't sound like I'm from the village. No. Nope. But my mother <laughs> never allowed us to speak improper English. She mm. never. She was like, because you're going to have to learn how to work on both sides of the fence. Wow. Mm. She was like, you're not going to be here all the time. So you, when you were around white people, you need to be able to speak like them. When you're here, then you need to act like you, you know, you might need to act like you're from here. And I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, so that's how we grew up. You know, but wow. I, I tell anybody, my family ain't made up of nothing but, well, was made up of a bunch of you know game bangers, drug dealers, a few pimps. Actually, do you have any brothers or sisters? I got one older, one younger. Okay. My older brother, <clears throat> my older brother played football and basketball at Robeson. Um, mm. and then spent most of his adult life in and out. Mm-hmm. Uh, my young my younger brother, I I was the one that kind of you know kept charges on him. So he went to ended mm. up going to the Marines coming out. Um, now he's working on his third degree, um, mm. you know, but that whole thing is, you know, and I got multiple cousins, but that's what Illinois did for me. I was mm. able to bring my brothers and my family down there. Then I was able to, you know, give them experiences overseas and stuff like that, which changes people's lives. But you, yeah. you asked about the early upbringing. I mean, you go from one rough area to another rough area, rough area, but, right. but, it, but it doesn't change, you know, all yep. hoods are the same. Yep. You know, the same thing I had to do when I was on the West Side to get people to respect me was the same thing I had to do when we moved to Inglewood. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, and after that, you you kind of just take life day by day. But at mm-hmm. that time, when we moved to Inglewood, my mom's drug problem kicked in. So we really had to grow up. Right. You know, my older brother, by this time, like I said, he was, you know, he was hooping as well as playing football, but he was also game banging. Mm. So he out in the street, he doing his thing. My mom was trying to work, you know. And so all of that fell on me to take care of my younger brother, to take care of the crib. And at that time, you must have knew then, like, the streets, I, I, I ain't doing that. I'm looking at my older brother, like, uh, that don't even entice me. Actually, you know, Art, I, I, I was starting to creep that way. Really? I, I was really starting to creep that way. I started doing, you know, I'll tell y'all, this is going to be in my book, but I started doing some things that, you know, I, I I know I shouldn't have been doing. Right. But you know, you, you again, you you you. This is how people become products of, of their environment. Environment. Yeah. You know, your, my friends were doing it. Everybody else was doing. It. I was like, oh shit, let me try to. And now I'm young at this time. Don't get me wrong. I'm like 13. Wow. I haven't even hit high school yet. Wow. You know, so we're we're out there. Um. And then when I hit, um, when I was getting ready to go to high school, I was walking from Hamilton Park one day. And my older brother was out there hooping mm. and he called me over and he was like, dude, we need one more player to, you know, so we can play five on five. So we go and I go out there and I play. i never played basketball before that. And we're walking back to the crib, leaving Hamilton Park. And he was like, bro, he was like, you need to, you need to hoop. And I'm like, what you talking about, man? I was like, I didn't even like basketball. I only wow. played because he, because he said so. And I, again, had never played. And so he was like, you need to play basketball. You playing basketball. Basically, he was telling me. The sport didn't interest you at all? No. No, I was, it was, it was, I was too, I was too wrapped up in life, bro. Trying to take care of my younger brother again. My mom had, was having her issues, even though she was a functioning addict at that time. Mm-hmm. So she was going to work. And so when I was coming from school, I had to take care of my brother. So I wow. it wasn't even a thought in my mind. And, um, so then my brother was like, dude, you got to hoop. And so I was coming to the end of uh, my eighth grade year at Yale. 
And he told my mom it was time to pick school. So Robinson was right down the street. Inglewood right. was the other school in our neighborhood. And then Simeon, mm. you know, where we could go to school. And he told my mom, he was like, Dion needs to go to Simeon. Mm. And I was protesting. I'm like, man, I'm like, Robinson, <laughs> right down the street. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I got to get on the bus. I got to get on the bus and go to school. I'm like, <laughs> right. man, I'm like, it's right down the street. And so my mom was like, why? And at that time, this is when Benji was in school. So my brother was playing against Benji, you know, in the Red South. Mm. And so he told my mom, he was like, if he can, if Hamburg can make a Ben Wilson, he can make a Deion Tom. That's that's how I ended up at, at Simeon, because my mom took me there the first day and said, we sat and we talked to Hamburg. By this time, I had hit a growth spurt. So I went into high school at about 6'3", 6'2", six, about 6'3". Damn, and from eighth grade to freshman year, you grew that fast? Four inches. Four inches over the summer. I was sick all summer, too. And I'm wow. talking about knees hurt. Uh, we went to, I can remember going to the doctor like three, four times. And like emergency. What, what did you think was happening? We had no idea. We had no idea. And we had no idea because when I was like young, young, like less than a year old, I had leg braces. And shit like that on. Wow. And, um, yeah, and the doc told my mom that I would never, you know, run right, you know, and all these other things. So we, she didn't know if it was that recurring, okay. but mm-hmm. the doc was like, there ain't nothing I can do. He's growing. Wow. So I shot up four inches that summer, went into Simeon as a freshman, had never played basketball outside of what I had done on the court. Mm-hmm. Irvin Small, uh, Big E was my basically first teacher, the way, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, the way Hamburg did things over at Simeon, the upperclassmen had to take the freshmen or the mm-hmm. underclassmen and teach them everything. Wow. So, I mean, when I say everything, we were in the gym on Sundays because Hamburg would play in this old man league on Sundays. He'd have me and Irvin there. Before practice, I had to be in there with Irvin. After practice, I had to be in there with Irvin. <laughs> so it was just, all, it was all basics all the time, man. Fun so interesting, man. Your Fun your hoop dream story is so different than other yes. people's story. Because most people oh, yeah. we talk to, they say, "Man, I was playing basketball since I was five years old." Now here right. you are at going into high school, just really discovering the love of the game. How how do you think that shaped your 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 process? Because most times you think people discover that that love young. Where did you find yeah. the love as you was, especially if he's throwing seniors on you to get you <laughs> right? right. <laughs> you well, well, I'm, a, I'm about to blow your mind even more because I, I didn't, there was no love for me at, at mm. that time. I mean, when I was playing, I was like, you know, I, I don't know how many times I missed practice, man. I used to skip practice. I used to get my ass whooped with the paddle like every what? week. <laughs> every week. I, I didn't yeah. like it. I didn't like it. You know, I was just doing it because my brother made me. And because so I was so I was getting the paddle like every week for missing practice. Wow. So I remember this one time. I'm a person that, you know, you challenge me, I'm going to challenge you back. Mm. So Jimmy Collins had came to, you know, the assistant coach for Illinois, was there recruiting and seeing Irvin and Nick Anderson. Mm. And I remember after practice one day, I'm in there taking my tape off and, and all of this stuff. And. Coach C was in there talking to Hambrick, and he was like, yeah, you know, talking to the boys, boys. He was like, yeah, what about Big Slam over there? And Hambrick turned and he looked. He was like, oh, that motherfucker ain't going to be shit. He was like, I can't even get him to come to practice. He was like, half the time he did not even hear. I can't even get him to come to practice. Now, for me, that was a challenge. Wow. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm going to show said, you. And he said it loud enough for where you can hear it. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. Wow. And, and I'm sure, but see, Hambrick was a master at knowing how to motivate people. And, mm. and I think that's, he knew how to push my button. And that was the push of the button. I'm like, man, I got a college coach in here and you're going to tell him I ain't going to be no good. And good. Right. I'm okay. I'm going to show you. <laughs> and that was you going to embarrass that, me like that for. Yeah. And, and that was kind of that fire to, to get things going. I'm like, all right, but it's still, but it wasn't, you know, like, and I agree with you when you say my story is different. Dudes loved the game. I was like, all right, I'm just going to do it so I'll prove you wrong. And right. then I started to fall in love with the competition. Mm-hmm. You know, so, all right, you know, and I looked at it and I think I had, now that I look back on it and I got my therapist, I think I had a lot of pent up anger. 
Mm-hmm. So when I was mm-hmm. playing against people in the other uniform, I just I, I tell people all the time, man, this is war. This, yeah. this ain't no game. This is war. I'm in here. I'm out here to kill whoever is not in the same uniform that I'm in. Yeah. You know, and that was my mentality when I was in practice. That was the mentality when I was in games. If your yep. shirt ain't the same color as mine, bro, I'm coming at you. You 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 looked at you looked at when you played, you had a scrowl on your face like it was just one of them. Oh, like yeah. you, and you and you and you went hard every time. Like, yeah. And, and and that's that's just the way it was. I mean, I you know, in in a way it, it was a good thing and in a way it was bad because like, you know, dudes be like friends and like I hated the dudes that came. <laughs> hated them. Right, hated them. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. and I mean and nothing personal, you know, now, you know, Johnny and and and, and Jamie and Mark, yeah. I love all those dudes. But when when we were there, yeah. Man, I I can't like you because if I like you, then I'm not gonna. That my motivation was to try to like kill you. That that Take was my motivation. Right. So I can't like you, and 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 want to kill you at the same time. So absolutely, you know that that was kind of the the mentality for me. But after Hambrick did that to me, you know, it was a driving force. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna prove you wrong, and, and that was the drive. Did Irvin Small know about this? I know he showed up in practice one day looking at you like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> what the hell is... Dude, what then got into you? Yeah, well, Big E was still better than me, so he used to kick my ass. So I, 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 I would readily <laughs> admit that. I'm okay with that. You know, he was still bigger and stronger at that time, so right. I, I had to take my lumps. Yeah. But, um, yeah, moving forward after that, it was just all... Let, let me do this. And then sophomore year came around. That's when, you know, my name still started to blow up. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm like, fuck, I can use this to change my life. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't have to live in Inglewood. I don't have to live, you know, in the village because now all these letters come and I'm like, man, I can get to college. Mm. So this was, this became the driving force after that. I was like, okay, I need, I can go ahead and flip this into something big. But again, I wasn't thinking about, like the NBA or, or nothing like that. I wouldn't think about hoops in that way. I was just thinking, oh, shit, get me out of here so I can get to college, and then I can figure the rest out from there. Mm-hmm. Wow. See, that's, that's what's so crazy right now, man, again, hearing your story. How, how did you develop? Because, again, since you didn't pick the ball up, like, AJ and that, man, we was bouncing that ball probably since we, as long as we can remember. Where did the skill set develop at? And I'm really saying this because there's a lot of kids who probably want to play the game. Yeah, but I may mm-hmm. think because I'm 13 or 14, I can't, I'm I'm already, you know, behind the eight ball. How did you develop a skill set at such a late start in the game? Well, that that's where two great teachers comes in. Um mm. Irvin, if anybody go back and look at Irvin's game, man, it, it was it was his footwork is exceptional. I mean, I had other guys that had more notoriety around him, so he didn't get the same notoriety. Right. But when Irvin was graduating, I mean, he had schools like Wake Forest and, and you know, big ACC, mm-hmm. SEC schools recruiting him. But nobody knew that because, you know, the Nick Andersons, the Deion Butlers, all of those names kind of shined bigger than his. But he had hella footwork. His game was tight. And Hambrick was a great teacher. And as I told you before, we were in there before practice. After practice, mm. and then he had me in there on the weekend. So there were a lot of reps mm. you know, that were that were being done. Um, and then there was there was no real sleeping. And then I got to give the power. I got to give all the power to the man upstairs. I had a God given talent, you know, and, and mm. it just took somebody, somebody teaching me how to use it and, and how to develop it after that. I mean, like I told you, my brother was my first scout. I mean, I'm right. eighth grade. I'm playing outside with, you know, who was on that court? You know, Stretch, Liberty, Marcus's brother was out mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Um, and Frederick Hughes and his brother Chris were out there on that court. I mean, these are legends from the city. Right. And here I am, a little eighth grader out here hooping with these dudes, and my brother tell me, dude, you got to hoop. Mm. So I must have been doing something right, right. against those dudes. So, and, and this is somebody that, again, had never bounced a basketball before then. So there had to be a lot of God-given yeah. um, talent in there. And then Hamburg and Irvin were able to bring it out and, and help me continue to develop it. And then that inner fire to beat people. And if I had to beat you, then I mean, I got to work at it. I got to be better at it. Mm. And um, 
just when we were on the court, I wasn't gonna let nobody out drive me. I know that's right. I mean, your game, man. You had, you had, you had drop step. You had over the shoulder right, over the shoulder left. Like, I mean, you had a complete full. <laughs> like, you know, you the big Arsenal. man on Simeon, but you, you, you didn't, you didn't play like the traditional big man. Like, you was, nah. you would come out on the perimeter, pump fake, motherfuckers. Go, I mean, all of that. Hey, that that's that's Bob Hamburg. My freshman year, man, uh, which is crazy, and I tell people all the time, I, I only knew how to shoot two shots my whole freshman year. What? I shot a left hand hook shot and I shot a right hand hook shot. That was it. That's it. That was it. And and so that was how our development started. I mean, it started off from shooting a mic, doing the mic and drill. All the mm. time in practice. And for your yeah. listeners that might not know, I was head under the basket, left hand, right hand. Mm. Then I turn around, it'd be left hand, you know, so now I'm doing the reverse micing. Then I had to turn around and take a big step back. So now I'm basically shooting short sky hooks, yeah. you know, and mm. that's that was the building block from there. And so going into the sophomore year is when I learned to drop step. I learned to jump hook instead of the sky hook because I'm like, man, that's a little inefficient. At least I thought it was. And I thought it didn't look cool. So mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, <laughs> I can't keep doing that. My shit looked basic. I don't, you know, Kareem right, was, right. Kareem's had all the points, but Kareem's game wasn't cool. Right, so right, I'm like, all right, right no, I got to flip this over right. to do something that's a little bit cooler. So, you know, started adding those little things in there. And, you know, and then you start watching um other people that that are playing the game and you kind of mark you know mimic them mm -hmm. you know dr j like everybody loved mike and i get it but dr j was my michael jordan mm -hmm. right and i'm like Shit, if he can do that then i need to learn how to do this and bernard king so this is where a lot of the post stuff came from from watching those guys and you know because i didn't watch a lot of college basketball y'all you know there wasn't a lot of college basketball on tv at that time right unless you're watching paul in the city because shit at that time we had like five channels yeah, right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Two, Watching five, the seven, and, and nine. the occasional Illinois game that came That's on Channel right. Nine. Right. That's right. You know, so you start watching those guys. Start watching Snake um, when he was, you know, Ken Norman when he was down at Illinois, and, yeah. and guys like that. And then you start trying to mimic your game a little bit after them. But I was a big, you know, Bernard King and and you know Dr. J fan, so I was watching them and trying to do whatever they were doing. Dion, let me ask you this: at that time. Like Benji was before you, but what was the hoop lot that you knew about him? Well, again, that coming from my brother, um, my brother talked a lot about Benji. He had a lot of respect for his game. Again, he was at Robeson. Mm. So the first time I actually had a chance to watch Benji play was City Championship. They were playing Tim Hardaway and Carver. Damn. Uh, at that time. And I remember me and my brother were sitting in the in the our dining room, we had a TV in our dining room and we were sitting there and we were watching this and he's pointing these people out. Mm. This is Ben, you know, this is the, he's pointing them all out. And I'm like, damn. So I'm watching Ben and, and I couldn't tell how tall he was, but my brother's like, yeah, he's like six, eight, six, nine. Look at him, handle the ball. Look at him shooting. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, damn, I'm like, this, this dude got it, <laughs> you know? And it wasn't that he was shooting all the time. He was passing, hitting people in the right place and the right. Oh, I'm like, wow. So then I ended up watching them when they were downstate because mm. that year they won state. So I'm watching them when they're downstate and we're sitting right there again in front of the TV. And I'm like, whoa. So that's why when my brother was like, you know, again, I wasn't in love with basketball. I ain't going to even act like I was. Right. But he was like, that's why you need to go to Simeon. And there you go. See, if Hamburg could make a, a Benji Wilson, he damn sure could make a Dion, baby. Make a Dion. <laughs> and, 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 and he, he did. did. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> Hey, let me ask you this, man. Were there any other sports that, since you didn't have a love for basketball, were there any other sports that you did coming up? I, I loved baseball, man. Wow. I, I loved baseball. So I played um, the, what is it, the, the little kids. That's, that's my first sport I started playing was baseball. Mm -hmm. So over in the village at the YMCA is when they had a little baseball league. So mm -hmm. I, I started playing in that little baseball league when I was – maybe nine, mm. somewhere, somewhere around there. So I played baseball and I mentioned I was walking back when I was in Hamilton Park. I had just left a baseball game, mm. you know, so we had just finished playing a baseball game and that's when I was walking past the courts to come home and my brother was like, all right, yeah, you need to come over here. 
And, <laughs> and that's when I went. Yeah, and that's he was like, we need somebody. And then I'm like, all right, cool. Let me change my shoes. And I played with him. Still had the little baseball uniform on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that was that was my first love, man. And and to this day, I, I still love baseball. I mean, wow. I watch it all the time. If it's on TV, I'm a Cub fan. Mm-hmm. You know, people are like, oh, how you how you a Cub fan? I'm like, man, because my grandmother, my grandmother and my great grandfather were Cub fans. So mm. my earliest memories is sitting with my pop on the couch watching the Cubs in black and white. So, That's right. That's <laughs> I'm like, right. So I'm a Cub fan. There you go. On WGN. Right, on WGN. Right, right. <laughs> hey Dion, where did y'all play in your senior year, the the final four? Um, I think it was at UIC, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, that's I where the games used to be at. That's what yeah, that's where the city cha- championship games used to be. It was at USC. Do you remember? Oh, that's right, because then they moved them out to Chicago State when they built their they new facility. Yep, so it was at UIC. Yeah. Do you remember who y'all played? Who, who was in that Final Four? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I know senior year we lost to King uh, to get there. Mm. After that, bro, again, it, it's shut, it's shut off mode. <laughs> like wow. people ask me, people ask me, you know, even after we won games, you know, did you how many points you have? I mean, I'm like, dude, I don't know. Wow. Because if we didn't win, if we didn't win, the rest of it didn't matter. Didn't matter. I, 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 could, yep. I could care less. I hated losing. Mm. I hated losing. I, I ain't. I didn't really care about you know all that other stuff. I just didn't want to lose. Right. And so I didn't care about how many points, how many this that. Did I did I just destroy the dude that was on me? I, that's all I cared about. I didn't want him to score on me, you know. And that's that's both ends of the court. I didn't want him to score on me, but I wanted to score on him every time. Hey, were there um, since you again you started the game so late? And let me just throw this out here too, man. You you said some names, man. I just want to just show some love to them names, man. Like Alfred Hughes, man. Come on, who had a commercial when we was coming up, man? I just I shoot like God. I mean. You said some names and Stretch Liberty. I mean, come on, man. These are some legends. But speaking of legends and legendary stuff, when you was in high school, did you go play at the parks? And if so, what parks did you play at? Um, I, I, You know where I did most of my hooping at? Down in my, at Gladstone uh, in my neighborhood. It was always hooping out at Gladstone. Mm. Um. And so we would always be behind Gladstone out south. We went to the Avalon Park. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We'd go hoop over there on the lake. What's that? Thirty first, yeah, or whatever. Um, when I was when we lived over in Inglewood, right off of seventy first and Wentworth, there was a park there. We used to always hoop there. Um, then they got shot over there. Mm. <laughs> Not they weren't shooting at me, but right. you know, you you on the court right. and some dudes get into a fight and they just start busting on the court. Wow. I, think I was out there with Terry, my brother and Terry Sampson that day, and some you know Terry played a semi-on too with a bunch of other dudes, and they start dude hops over the fence, runs his car, and just start indiscriminately just blasting. And we were like, what? And so we wow. all scattered. Those are the ones that I remember that mm-hmm. I can remember clearly where where we would go and spend a lot uh, of time. But living on the west side, wherever the ball was playing, dudes was like, "Hey, you want to go hoop?" I'm like, "Yeah, let's go." Mm. And, and and I was going um, again because it was a competition. I, I didn't care who it was. I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to kill people, man. <laughs> hey, so hey, so give us. You didn't graduated, Simeon. How you how that recruiting process? went down and how did did you play in the mcdonald's game i did um i I did play in the mcdonald's game uh who was on my team shaq was on my team um damn that's when you know that's when you know you're getting up there um but i you know our team was it was the west team so there were multiple guys from my team from illinois on over um but daryl cunningham chris jackson should have been in that era right too right no, Chris is older than me. We had, um, you know what? I, why am I drawing a brain fart on this? Um, <laughs> Tracy, Murray, Tracy Murray, but Tracy was from out west. Mm-hmm. Um, Kenny Anderson. Because when I came out, I was ranked number three behind Kenny Anderson and Shaquille O'Neal. Okay. And then I was three. You had Lawrence Funderburg. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Was Steve Smith from Detroit? Yeah, how, how do you think I am? <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> I'm no, like, Steve is older than me. <laughs> but y'all, you played against him, though, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Played against him in college. In though. college, right. When, when he was at yeah, when he was at Michigan State. Um, his senior year was my sophomore year. Yeah. So he's a couple years older than me. A couple two, no, three years, because I didn't play my freshman year. But you asked about the the recruiting guild. I mean, recruiting was ugly and it picked up fast. Really? You know, and you guys know this, man. Um, my final five, my last five was Arizona, UCLA. Iowa, Illinois, and Minnesota. Mm. Um, Interesting. Did you go on all those visits? I did not. Um, when I was scheduling, when I was scheduling the visits, I sat down with my granny. Um, my grandma was really close. I mean, we were really close, and this especially during this time because you know my mom's drug problem kicked in. So I lived mm. with my grandmother, um, you know, pretty much my whole life. Mm. But I sat down with her as we were getting ready to start to schedule these visits. And she was like, baby, I'll tell you right now, if you go to California or you go to Arizona, I'm not going to see you play. Mm. You know, mm. my grandma, she was like, I'm not getting on no planes. So I, I'll never get to see you play. So I had to call the coaches and be like, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to make this visit. Right. You know, it's not going to happen. So I took my first visit to Minnesota mm. um, when Clem Haskins was there. Love Coach Haskins. Mm. Um, really liked the campus. And what turned me off was when they took a, took me through these tunnels, right? So mm-hmm. we're walking through these tunnels, and I'm like, why are we in these tunnels? And they were like, well, this is how you're going to get the class. I'm like, what do you mean it's how I'm going to get the class? They were like, because it's cold. I'm like, dude, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> used, I'm used to the cold. They were like, well, it, it gets about 40 below zero up here. And they started talking about all the snow, and I was like, okay. And after that, it was just like, just there. I'm like, okay, cool. I got back to the crib because Hamburg would always say, you don't, you don't tell nobody no on your visit and you don't tell them yes. And you definitely don't sign nothing. Mm. So I got home. I, I'm at the crib. I talked to Hamburg, talked to my granny. I call Coach Haskins, Coach, I ain't going to be able to do that one. Yeah, I'm like, no, nah, I can't be going through no tunnels. <laughs> no, <laughs> Minnesota is a different code, though. We from the shot. Yes. Minnesota is a different kind of code. Oh, yeah. And wow. so when he was like, yes, yeah, it's like 40 below. I'm like, yeah, we ain't doing that one, bro. I, I got to ask you this, D. I'm hearing all your school names, but I don't hear DePaul. What's up with that? Well, no, I, DePaul, had, DePaul had love early. Um, mm. Freshman, sophomore year, early. Re- really liked DePaul. Again, you know, Mark Aguirre grew up not too far from us. You know, yep. all of, you know, all of those guys are pretty much from the west side, outside of uh, Terry Cummins, who was from the south side. So I follow a lot of DePaul. Right. Um, but when it when it started to really heat up, I was like, okay. And, and you guys know, I was like, man, I want to get out of the city. Right. I was like, I want to, I want to go somewhere, but I don't want to go too far. The same thing when I was at UIC, and, and kids would tell me, well, coach, you know what? I need the college experience. You know, and this was kind of the same mentality, but I was like, I, I need to 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 move get a little further out. And my grandmother used to always tell me, she was like, Hey, you need to you need to you need to get on from over here a little bit, you know. Mm. So she was trying to push me to go somewhere, but not too far so she can get a chance to see me play, but at the same time to be able to go and experience um stuff outside of that. So that that's why DePaul um didn't stay on the radar. Mm. But but in the beginning, they they were up there. And, and 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 here's my follow up to that too, man. You know, I I, I gotta ask this. You 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 can answer this or not. Illinois was mm-hmm. known. I don't know if it's true for dishing out a little cash. Mm-hmm. Did they toss some money your way? I, I will I will I will answer this well with with no problem, no issue. Went on my visit to Iowa. Had a great time. That's probably the best visit I take. I I, I tell you. Mm. He got game and got shit on the visit I took to Iowa. Wow. Not even close. Mm. I mean, it was BJ Armstrong was my host, Roy Marble and all those dudes. Ooh. Man, so I had a great time. Wow. And this is the first time I had heard about stuff with Illinois mm-hmm. was from folks from there. And I was told point blank, we'll we can we'll take care of you better than Illinois will. Mm. I'm like. What and to be honest, and this may be my naivete and having started this game late and and Hamburg kind of 
shielded us a lot of the time, but this may be my naive ears. I'm like, what the fuck is he talking about? Right, right. So to answer that question, uh, Jimmy Collins never offered me one crying dime. Mm. Not once. The reason I chose the University of Illinois is when I was sitting down with my grandmother and it came time to make decisions, and I'll tell everybody, my decision was between Iowa and Illinois. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my grandmother was like, I don't like Bruce Pearl. I don't trust him. She's like, I don't trust his eyes. He's a snake. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. I'll, and I, I pushed back. I was like, but Granny, I like him. He cool. Right. You know? He, he, he I a was player's like, coach. Exactly. And she was like, no. She was like, I, I just don't trust him. She was like, you do what you want to do, but I don't trust him. She was like, but I do. She was like, I, I trust because Lou Henson came, the only the one time I think Lou Henson came to my house, when my grandmother left there, she told me, she was like, I like him. She was like, I feel like I could trust him. So in this, con in this conversation, she said the same thing. She was like, I feel safe if you're down there with him. Mm. And then she loved, she loved, loved, loved Jimmy Collins. Jimmy Collins. So I was like, all right, then that's, that's where I'm going to school. Wow. And I was going to keep that under wraps, but then when I was at the McDonald's All-American game, mm -hmm. um, Dick Vitale came up and he was like, just tell me, I won't I won't put your name out there. Yeah, I, won't say it with you. I just want to know. And again, and again, I'm green, right? right. So I was like, well, if you're not going to say nothing, I'm green to the media because yeah. Hamburg didn't really let us talk to the media. So I'm green to the media. He was like, all right, cool. So I, I, you know, I get back to I get back to the crib. Everybody's like, "Oh, you going to Illinois?" And I'm like, "What the hell, y'all? How did everybody know this?" And they were like, "Oh, well, Dick Vitale said you going to Illinois." And I'm like, "This motherfucker, <laughs> damn Dick Vitale! He pulled a move. I'm supposed to say nothing." <laughs> that that night, Bruce Pearl called me on the phone. Mm. I hear you say you going to Illinois. And I'm like. Dude, I haven't made a decision yet. I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, they said da, 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 and we go through this whole thing. So mm -hmm. it really got rocky um, after that. But Will, to answer that question, never happened, bro. Mm -hmm. Never happened. So that I mean that right there pissed Iowa off. So they was like, let us put this story out. Let me throw this out there. Uh, we heard this because so they mad be because you didn't chose. Yeah, after going through that investigation. We we found out, I found out in that investigation, because we had to hire, the university had to hire us attorneys and everything else. Wow. So, of course, they're doing their investigation. So, apparently, Bruce Pearl's friend or college roommate or whatever was working in enforcement with the NCAA. Mm. And Bruce Pearl called him. And that's what kicked all of that crap off. Wow. With the allegation of something happened. And let's put it in some perspective so our, our audience know what's going on, because when you was coming out of high school, going into college, there was a situation that said that Illinois was, you know, had offered you money to play. Mm -hmm. And they was yes. trying to jeopardize your, you know, athletic scholarship to go to the yep. University of Illinois. So so continue. Yeah. He, they, he said that Illinois offered me eighty thousand dollars and a blazer uh, to attend uh, and play basketball in Illinois. So my, they go through this whole investigation. End of the investigation, of course, the NCAA does not find anything against me uh, or Jimmy Collins because there was nothing to find. Right. And I mean, and when I say they ripped my life apart, mm -hmm. they interviewed everybody that I was around. I'm talking about my what? girlfriend, her parents, um, high school friends that didn't even play wow. <laughs> sports, had nothing to do with it. Um I mean, it was, it was crazy, man. And then when I was actually on campus that mm -hmm. summer, I mean, it was like, these dudes, you thought they were the FBI. Like, it was a fucking Gestapo or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're like following me everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, dude, when I, I don't know. Maybe they expected me to go hop in a truck or something that they were following me. I'm right. like, bro, I'm broke. I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> I, ain't, I, ain't like none, I ain't like none of these kids down here. Yes, I'm broke. I'm at a I I I'm at a freaking I worked at the Boys and Girls Club, you know, making eight dollars an hour. That was my summer job. For like, your summer job, summer. yeah. You know, and then, you know, a, a bro, I couldn't eat. You know, there time we go back to the when I was in the dorms freshman year, that was times we couldn't I 
couldn't even eat. Ain't have food. You don't make it back to the dorms by the time. And it ain't like today where these kids have cars bonk of what they can eat, what right. they can eat. You don't make it back to the dorms in that cafeteria all the time. You ain't eating. That's right. Wow. That's right. You, you know, you stuck. So, you know, you, you bro, I'm from the shop. I figure out a way to eat. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that, and that's what I did. You you get to Illinois on the heels of the of that crew. And, and yes. And, and that's the thing. I tell anybody, there's two things about that investigation that, you know, I can't forgive and, and, and that I'm really pissed off about. And I'm still pissed off about one is being able to play with the rest of those guys from the flying line I team. Yes. Because I, I am in, in, in complete belief that if I'm on that team with Kendall, Steve was still there. Yep. Marcus would have been there. Yep. The only person who was strong was Nick and, and Lowell Hamilton. Yep. Damn. And, oh, and Kenny. And Kenny was gone. But I believe we're right back in a position to put ourselves back in the final four. Absolutely. Mm. You know, and so that's one of the things I'm really pissed off about because I didn't get that opportunity to really win at the level that I wanted to. Um, and, and then, of course, I, I'm a firm believer that Jimmy Collins was next in line for that job. For that job. And mm. his name got slandered. And then they, you know, the university pushed Coach Henson out, you know, in 95. Yeah. Then he had to go to UI. He went to UIC. Mm-hmm. And then what did he do? He turned around during his tenure, first several years at UIC, had never been to the NCAA tournament. Now they're in the NCAA tournament and so forth and so on. And, and I think he just did not get the shot that he deserved. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's the thing that that pissed me off about what what he did, what Bruce Pearl did. But mm-hmm. you know, can't go back. I you know can't go back and change it now. Right. So so talk about because again, your, your freshman year, man, it was like no other. Talk about that first week on campus and and really just just getting in there because I think for all athletes, it's nothing like being on the court. Talk about yes. the first couple of runs with the guys when you get down there. Well, you know, the, remember my first year I didn't play. Right. So that first year when I stepped on, on, on campus, first of all, it was a complete and utter culture shock. Mm. You know, again, I grew up in the village. The only white people I saw in the village was police. Right. You know, so now I get on campus and this is pretty much all you see. Yeah. You know, so it, it was scary. It was exciting. All of those things all, all, all you know, balled up into one. Mm-hmm. But I was fortunate. I had dudes down there that could help me walk through. I had Urban on campus. Mm. You know, had become real tight with Steve Bardo, had become real tight with Kendall Gill. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I had guys that were from where I was from, like Irvin and Nick mm-hmm. and Marcus, that could show me what campus is like. And then I had other dudes that were not where I'm from that could show me also how to navigate um, campus in Camp- a different way. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I loved my freshman year, man, cool. e- even though I wasn't playing. Um, and I wasn't practicing, but that was my choice that I didn't practice because the NCAA didn't tell me I couldn't practice, but I was so pissed off. Right. And it bothered me and it hurt to be out there and knowing I wasn't going to play, knowing I wasn't going to get involved, knowing, you know, so I'm like, you know what, why am I torturing myself like this? So I lived my whole freshman year like a regular college student. Wow. Man. You know, college students, college students think athletes got it good. They don't understand how good they got it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't understand how good they got it, man. I mean, because when you're an athlete, you guys know your time is structured. Structured already. Set for you. Practice, study hall, weights. It's all structured. Yep. See, regular student on campus, man. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Right. I had a whole lot of fun. Hey, you see now, the smile on his face? Grade, yeah. You see the yeah. smile on his face? <laughs> yeah. Man. But I, you know, you still have to do the, you gotta do the work. So I did the work. Mm-hmm. Um and but I was I was again, I was so bitter about not being able to play. And and this is if you ask me if there's one thing that I regret, this would be the one thing that I regret in college is that I had went to the gym and went to practice and actually worked and played with those guys. Um, that's the one thing I, 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 I regret because moving into my sophomore year, mm-hmm. 
you know, which was my athletically, my freshman year, I was still physically not developed enough to really contend. Mm. Um, even though I did, you know, I broke the freshman scoring record and all of these had a bunch of the freshman records, but nowhere near what I could have done if I had had myself in practice and, and working the weights and everything else mm. that I was supposed to do. Give you a story, Jimmy, um, we're playing Ohio State. And um, Coach Collins was like, I've been telling you to work out all, all year, all summer. You, you've been working out. You've been doing your thing. I'm like, uh, you know, yeah, Coach, I'm, I'm all right. Still, again, with this mentality of, of not loving the game, mm. but loving the competition of the game. Mm-hmm. So, the, so, the, so the, you know, the practice part wasn't one of those things that I really looked forward to. Well, let's just say I <laughs> didn't look forward. I didn't put the work in the way I should have. Mm. So we're out there on the court. I'm defending um, Treg Lee and Perry Carter. Mm. Now, Perry Carter had just won best best body in the state of Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the. Uh... I, I weighed I, I weighed about two hundred and ten pounds, and. Perry Carter was at least, I can tell you what he looked like he weighed, mm-hmm. 240, 250, chiseled out of granite, rock hard. I'm trying to fight around him and swim over right. and, and get in defensive position. So I get back over to the bench, and uh, Coach Collins comes over. He sits next. No, I used to always have to sit next to him, empty seat. So I go there, and I sit down, and puffing and puffing. He was like, uh, <laughs> didn't, I tell you, didn't I tell you to get your ass in the gym? <laughs> He saw what you was feeling out there. Right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Dion skipped the weight room over the summer. So, uh... <laughs> man, hey, hey, um... hey, D, let me ask you this, though, man. There was nothing found uh, with the NCAA investigation. Why weren't you able to play your freshman year? Well, the university had made that decision before the investigation was even finished. Okay. Mm. Um, so the university is the one that... Uh, forced me to redshirt my freshman year. Forced you to. And so that investigation continued almost throughout the whole year. Wow. 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 And then at the end, they found some improprieties, like I said, that had nothing to do with me right? or or Jimmy Collins. It was things that had taken place before I was even, you know, thought of, before I was even down. Right. Um, And then they they slapped us with a lack of institutional control. Uh, which meant mm. the loss of scholarships, meant the loss of um, the first two years I couldn't go to the NCAA tournament. And I think we lost four scholarships. So, I mean, that was that, that was some harsh, um, harsh punishment for what I heard were some minor offenses. Right. You know, and one of the dudes from the NCAA came out, and, and if I can remember this correctly, his statement was something like, you know, just because we couldn't find something doesn't mean something didn't happen. Wow. Well, yeah, it does. Wow. <laughs> That's wow. exactly what it means. Wow. Evidence? No evidence. You find something, exactly. you don't find nothing. Ain't no smoke burning, no flame, none of that. Exactly. So well, they were exactly always it trying to find something on you guys. They, I mean, for as long as I can remember, they were always trying to find something on Illinois because they kept comparing you all saying, Illinois is, you know, Syracuse of the Midwest. I mean, that's how, mm-hmm. how they were defining mm-hmm those teams yep. back then. Uh, and I think they was just mad, though, Will, because the flying Illini was just, like, killing. Oh. I think he he had Bobby... I mean, we had they had Bobby Knight mad. Everybody in the Big Ten was mad at the fight in Illini. They wanted something yep. to find. Uh, them other schools wanted to try to find something on them, man. Because what it was, in, in my opinion, is, you know, Coach Collins in Illinois would had Chicago on lock. Absolutely. <laughs> on lock. She said, come on, nothing else coming up out of here, going nowhere. No. I mean, you get four or five straight Mr. Basketballs from the state of Illinois. I, when Who does that in any state? Yeah. It, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. So, I mean, on lock. So, it, they had to bring down the Giant to be able to come back yeah. into the city and recruit. Because Bobby stayed in the city recruiting. Judd Heathcote, who was at Michigan State at the time, Tom Izzo stayed in the city yep. recruiting. Mm. Yep. All of these dudes was down in the city. And like you see them now, you see players going everywhere else. They were all in the city and in the state of Illinois 
because they know we got, you know, if not the best hoopers in the, in the in this country, we got the we're up there at the top, the top five, top ten. Well, they wanted to you know, see you better than me. I was gonna say top two or three. I was gonna say <laughs> three, <laughs> one, two or three. Right. And and they're always were trying to come in, even when I was coaching. You know, you go to these, you go to the, uh, any of the tournaments, any of the Christmas thing, Thanksgiving tournaments. Yep. Them dudes are always in there all the time. And at that time, you weren't getting none of the players out of the city. Mm. It just wasn't going to happen. As a Chicago player, I even felt this when I was kind of, you felt almost like a, like, like, like you wanted to play for Illinois because of the, the history and the tradition. When you see a Kendall Gill, Nick Anderson and these guys going to the final four. And it was something about if you was a top ball player, Illinois was just on your list just to be on your list. It was, it was almost a for certain. But again, when that situation, like you said, he knocked down the giant, that I think that really hurt the Illinois program. And it kind Oh, of, it did. Can you expound on that a little bit though? No, it, it did. Cause I, I'll tell you, after me, you had Juwan, mm. you had Mike Finley. Yeah. You if you went down state, you had Conzo Martin. Yeah. Now, uh, you guys had Nuke on. Those dudes were coming to Illinois. So, could, you know, could you imagine who else may have been thinking about coming to Illinois? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we don't go on probation, we don't go on probation. Marcus Liberty stays. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Doc stays and he plays another year. I get to play with Doc. You got Nuke coming in the year after that. Mm. You know, if it's true that Mike Finn was coming, you got Mike coming to Illinois after that, along with Conzo Martin, who was coming, who would have been coming in with. Come on, Ooh. man! And his, his, and here's another crazy thing. I was, I was looking at Illinois, and my coach was like, "No, we're not gonna look that way because of the really? yeah, because of the because, oh, of, because the, of the investigation, because so, of the investigation, exactly. Wow. Which, by, exactly. Which, 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 by the way, the. Uh, I just got. I just got to clarify this, man. You know we right behind you, right? What do you mean? Then you, you graduated high school in ninety, right? No, eighty nine. Eighty nine. Right. Yeah. And we're we're, we're ninety one. So so yep. so we right behind you, man. We was coming. Yeah. We was coming, man. See, there you go. <laughs> we was coming, man. <laughs> there you go. Look what they did. We was you know. We was coming. And that and that's and that's what. That's what they did. They had to bring down Goliath, man. You bring down Goliath, now you can come play in his backyard again. Yeah. And, and, and that's what those dudes did. And fortunately, and, I, and, I appreci and I'm appreciative of this, Illinois did get the right next coaches in there, and they turned that thing around because when yeah. D. Brown and Darren Williams and all that crew, man, it, yeah. it, it, it brought back stability. Keywan Garris, Westerhouse. Keywan Garris, yeah. They started yeah. back getting the city guys again, so – Man, shout out to the University of Illinois. But, Dion, we want to do something with you real quick, man. We call this halftime. And we just okay. going to throw some quick hitters at you, man. And, 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 and I just got to start with this, man. The three toughest, and I don't care if it's high school or college, that you played against. Wow. Oof. Played against a lot of dudes, man. Not until I got to think. Even, um, even overseas. So Juwan was definitely one of. He said that about um, you. He said that about you. Yeah, hey, much respect, man. <laughs> I, I love him. Much respect. Glenn Robinson. Oof. The big dog. Ooh, big dog. Fucking monster, man. God. And and I'm a I'm a you know again there was a bunch of dudes in college, but I'm gonna give you one from from Europe. There was a guy named Dijon Bodiroga. What? One of the best players I have ever seen. In my life, what was special about him? I remember walking on the court again. I'm I go over in '94. My teammates are like, "Oh my God, we playing, we playing Bodie Roga." I'm like, "Man, fuck him!" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, really? Oh, I'm like, "Don't stop playing, y'all!" Holding this dude up like he's Jordan or something. In, in Europe, he was Jordan. Oh, in Europe, he was that dude. You know, I mean, you got the Tony Ku coaches and all those dudes that were coming that had just left, and he was is along that line of being in. You know, I guess he's from Croatia, but at that time it was Yugoslavia. Oh, it was all one country. So he's coming from there, and I'm like, dude, the hell with this dude. It's the first time I ever been hit with a sham god. <laughs> sham god hadn't even sham god hadn't even started doing the sham god yet. That's the first time I got hit with it. He goes hard left. 
reaches across, pull that thing back. I was like, okay. What? Now we playing the game. Now we playing the game. <laughs> and this dude was like 6'10". What? This is like a 6'10 dude. He moving. He, he got handles league. like that, D. Yes. Yes. Had. He old. He older than me. Had. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Dude, I'm trying. And people, we were always, even when we were over there, we'd be like, why isn't this dude going to the league? Mm. You know, why? Right. So I'm talking to him one day. I'm like, Deshaun, I'm like, really? I'm like, tell him, why, why aren't you? He was like, for what? He was like, I make the, I make enough money. I make more money here than I'm going to make over there. Wow. I'm like, and he was like, and I, he was like, and then I don't have to beat up my body and all these other things. I'm like, okay. I was like, I get that. And he had the city locked up. That. And he had the city locked oh, up. Yeah. Right. He sure did. Was playing in Barcelona at the time. I was like, man, I'm like, this dude getting it in. This is my quick hit of D. Your three favorite cities you lived in overseas, and what did you like about them? Three favorite cities. I got to put Tel Aviv first and foremost. Um, I, if anybody has not been to Israel, they need to go. Really? It's very westernized. It's like being in the it's like being in the shop, mm. but but with a beach, per capita, most beautiful women in the world, a nightlife that just does not stop. Wow. Food off the chain, the whole night. I mean, it's just amazing. Wow. So, that, that Tel Aviv is number one. Okay. Uh, number two would have to be Malaga, Spain. Malaga is in the south of Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like right on the coast. Uh, they got a team there I played for called Unicaja, and they got a big university there. It's one of the biggest in Europe. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of fun. I was. I, let me just say this. I went to play for them when I was 26. Mm-hmm. I was too young to be playing in Malaga. Really? What? I was too young. At 26? Yeah, I was still too young. I shouldn't have gone there until I was married. Wow. <laughs> so, and, and beautiful. But everything about it was beautiful. I mean, man, I had a I had a five bedroom villa that sat on 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 this peak mm-hmm. that looked off into the into the ocean. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was what? it was just sick. It was sick. That is crazy. And um, as far as living, the third would have to be Sevilla, Spain, mm. um, which is still in the south, a little bit further north of Malaga. Um, there, I actually almost bought a house. Uh, I was I was going to stay there. Wow. Really? I, I wasn't even coming back. Like it was going to be a cit- citizenship you was going to get? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My mom kind of gave me the guilt trip, and that's what that's what brought me back home. Mm. But if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for that, I'd still be sitting there. We'd be talking to <laughs> we'd be talking to this while I'm there. Hey, I, I don't know. If, I mean, you say in Spain, both of them are, are that was wine countries. Like, did, was that was those big producing wine uh, places? Uh, not so much. The wine country of Spain is is mainly up north. Okay. Um, more in the north, I guess northwest part of Spain is more so where the wine country is. Mm. Um, those climates are drier. Mm. Um. So they they do produce some some wines like that, yeah. but no, they're more industrial um, type places. Okay. Um, Malaga was more of a vacation wow. area. I mean, it was it's like being um, almost like being in Monaco or something like that. I mean, that that's how that. That's how Have Malaga you been was. back to either three of those since? I've been to Tel Aviv um, multiple times. Uh, I've been back to Israel. Well, my kids were born in Spain. My one my oldest daughter was born in Spain. And then my youngest was born in Israel. Mm. So my wife's family is from Israel. So we would go back there like every year. Um, I've only been back to Spain once wow. uh, since I retired. And that was back, that was back to the Canary Islands where, where my oldest daughter was born because we still had a bunch of friends that lived there. But yeah, that that's that hasn't I'm looking to go back there because, because I missed it. Hey, you see that smile on his face, AG? I see. I see. <laughs> Let me ask you this, D. In your entire college career, three toughest stadiums you played in? Three toughest stadiums I played in in college. Purdue is first. Mm. Uh, Mackey is right up there at the top, man. Mac- Mackey was, is, even to this day, when I watch, because, you know, I do the radio for men's basketball for Illinois. Um, when we go over there, those students are, like, basically right there. Uh, real tough place to play. Um, Assembly Hall in Bloomington uh, Indi- with Indiana, always a tough place to play. But one of the things I appreciated during my time there 
was they appreciate basketball. Mm. So even if we made a good play, you got an applause or you got a clap, but they still made it hard on you. So Assembly Hall is probably second. Mm. Um, third, I'd probably say I'm trying to do, I'm debating between Iowa and Michigan State. Um, mm. You know, Iowa, because when everything was going on with me, it was just the ruckus. I used to have dudes shaking keys. They crowd you. When I shoot free throws, they shake right. keys and all this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but but when you went up to uh East Lansing, man, you know, and at that time, Steve Smith, they had Mike Poplowski, they had um uh, Mastaginga, yeah. you know, later on, you know, they just they just and they, and the way they play, it's such a physical um brand of, of basketball that Mike Poplowski, I think his only job was just to beat the shit out of me. I think <laughs> That's that was it. his job. <laughs> Yeah, you just go out there and just beat Dion up. That's that was lean on him, push him in the back. Oh man, I'm telling you, now I used to. And this dude, you know, Mike's Mike's doing really good things for himself now. But he just had his big Frankenstein block head, and he was just like, yeah. And he was huge, man. I used to hit him with every elbow in the book, and it just seemed like he would just keep coming, wouldn't stop. Right. This is like, okay, dude, (laughs) really. So, you know, yeah, they feed and then, of course, Iowa had A.C. Earl. Mm. And as much as I love my boy A.C., man, I don't know if A.C. was just was just clumsy or physical right. or what. But A.C. used to try to pound on me. And then Chris Street, man, I just I just hated playing against Chris Street. Love him as a person. Hated playing against Chris Street. So those will have to be maybe a tie for the third. OK, mm-hmm. your three favorite sneakers you played in over the years. Well, I tell you, the worst was when I had to play at Illinois and them damn cons. You hated cons? <laughs> Man, I hated them cons. Hated them. Oh, hated wow. Them. And you couldn't wear nothing else, like your own pairs. You had to have, that was a team shoe. Like, that was. That was a team shoe. Wow. Yeah. We were sponsored, we were sponsored by um, Converse. Hated them shoe. Hated mm. them. Um, which one is the Jordan with the black and the black and silver that comes across the front? I don't know what number that is. Um, oh, the Concords. Uh, they, that may be it. That, that's my favorite shoe. The patent leather ones? No, no. Where's my Where's my phone? I gotta find it. I'm gonna tell you. But it's it's those Jordans. Um, but they were they had the they were white with like the black and gray across the, the where the strings are. Mm. Oh, I don't know which number, which number. I know you're talking about. That's the year you retired. Yeah, but those I love. Those are my best. And then uh, the second best would have to be the answers. The Al Allen Iverson Mm answers. Love that shoe too. Okay, that was when I first. That's when I moved into the three quarters too. So those those were great. Now, now in your in in your opinion, do you think shoes over the years then got better or they've gotten cheaper or worse like you like the old school 90s shoes or you like the the 2000 areas and in, and this new fly knit stuff they doing I, I don't like the shoes today mm. and I, I like them if, if they look good right you know but i, I don't think they uh withstand you know even with my kids because my daughter played basketball Okay. You know, I mean, the pairs of shoes I had to buy for her just because she'd be cutting and they'd rip and tear. And I mean, you know, back shoes back in the day, you can wear one pair all year. Yeah. Yep. And, and your cushion wasn't, you know, on the inside, your insole wasn't run down. You, you know, you still had grip on the bottom. Even if you wore them outside, you had grip on the bottom. You wear, you know, today's shoes, man, they they'd be torn up and, and done after like I changed my shoes when I was playing. After every three games, four games, mm. wow. because it felt like it didn't have the same stability. Now, that could have been a mental thing. I don't know, but it just didn't feel like it had the same stability. Right. Whereas when I was, I mean, yeah, I, this is one thing I can say about those cons, man. Your ankles were wrapped and, and you weren't going to have no problem with your ankles. And then I think that's the thing that they try to do now is they try to make them so light that they're using these, these materials. And then, of course, they mass produce them, um, you know, before we had our shoes made here. Now they're made other mm-hmm. places where the quality just isn't as good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm talking like this because I learned this all from my coaching days as well, not just my playing right. days. I'm like, fuck, especially when I was at the junior college, because we got to buy shoes. It's not like we had, you know, contracts with Nike or things like that. You know, I was the AD and the head coach. We, I had to buy those. So we had to make sure that they fit within the budget. And now I got to buy other shoes. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's right. That's right. Give me the 92,000, early 2000s over these shoes today. What do your daughter like? My daughter, well, see, my, I think my daughter, um, she was in love with Steph Curry. Mm. So I, I don't know if it was the shoe or the fact that she liked his pretty self. <laughs> right. But she wore, she wore, she wore curries. <laughs> she wore the SCs, baby. <laughs> man, I got to ask you this, man. When Dion is driving down the street, what is playing on your radio? You know, now that's, that's one of them. Now, you're talking about a passion? Music is a passion. What? I love music. Love, 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 love music. And, and I owe that to my mom. And, and when I say music, I'm talking about everything. We, she, we listened to everything when we were, we would clean on Saturdays mm -hmm. and we dance all day Sunday. Mm. That, that was, that was our thing. Wow. You know, so my mom taught me step all the way down to doing the Watusi what? and the twist. Mm -hmm. Oh my, come on. Knew everything. So my point is we listen to all kinds of music. So you ask what's in Dion's, what's on Dion's playlist. Absolutely. If I showed you my Spotify playlist, I mean, not Spotify, my Apple playlist, you'd be like, damn, cause I'm going from the sixties with the OJs mm -hmm. all the way up to today with, you know, two of the rappers today. I listen to everything. Man. Well, give me some names. Got give me some names. Who are you listening to? Give me some names. All right. Hold on. Let me, let me, I mean, of course, everybody, I like Jeezy. Mm -hmm. Um, well, today, or oh, which ones you want? Give me, give me both. Give me both. You got some Bruno Mars in there? <laughs> Do not have Bruno Mars in there. No. <laughs> but I got some Al Green, mm. I got some Alicia Myers, Energy Stone, mm. Anthony David. Do I even got some Arrested Development? Ooh. Um, I got. Got this one sister. She's a, a country singer, Ashley Amber. Mm -hmm. Now you gotta make sure you look mm -hmm. her up. Mm -hmm. Even if you just look at the pictures, you look her. <laughs> up. I got some Bobby Caldwell on here. The Brothers Johnson, Burner Boy, mm -hmm. um, Cleo Soul, um, Corinne Bailey Ray, Counting Crows. Right. Now, where's my You could have stopped hip? at oh, the Brothers Jones. Of course, there's Earth, Wind, and Fire, the Isley Brothers, brother. the OJ Bowen <laughs> in there. Dwelle. A whole spectrum of things. No, no, bro, I'm telling you, from the, the old school, old school footsteps in the dark all the way up to uh, country music. I got everything on there. I just love music. Hey, you know, AG, Dion, Dion remind me of, of, of Curtis. You know, you got in this car, you can't mess with his radio. He already had his tracks ready to go. Right. <laughs> and you was going and you was gonna listen to it. And if it was a song he wanted you to hear, he would wait till you got in the car and then press play. <laughs> uh, yep. Yep. That that sounds about right. <laughs> hey, Dion, this is the last halftime question, man. I mean, uh, quick hitter. Three essential items you gotta take with you when you are playing overseas. My music, definitely. That was the first and foremost. And at the time when I was playing over there, bro, it, it was, you know, you didn't get TV in English. I mean, you had two channels in English. I had Eurosport and CNN. Wow. So I would I would stack up on, on all the bootleg DVDs I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you know, so you know what he's saying, right? Before, before he went overseas, he had to make a stop at the barber shop. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. And really, whatever that, um, and I used to make trips to come back and get whatever those essential foods and snacks, mm. whatever I, I had to take with. Me. Had to take my hot Cheetos with me because you can't get hot Cheetos over there, bro. Wow. I mean, to this day, I still eat those, and I probably shouldn't because I put, put on a couple more pounds. I should probably leave them <laughs> Cheetos alone. But you know, whatever that is, essential snack was, because we had to take it with because they just didn't. They you know they didn't eat like that in Spain, so got to got to make sure you get it. I know when the people, the locals saw you eat some Cheetos, I know they was like, what the hell is he eating? <laughs> oh, I turned on, I turned a whole lot of people on to a bunch of stuff that they had never had. I started making trips when I was bringing my stuff back during, over Christmas break. I'd be bringing them the same shit back. Yeah, could you bring me one of those? I'm like, yeah, I got you. I got you. Fellow on the fellow.
I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. No, I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all but going there again. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith. Think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office in one day. They gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith. Think I'm balling like I'm Martha Agee. I'm box office in one day. They gon' have to pay me. Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Written and produced by Arthur Agee, Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, with audio engineering from Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm balling like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a sealed fate. More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha Agee I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates I'm hoop dreamin', tryna fight against a sealed fate More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha Agee I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me